the history of how the city gets water, acquires water, and um, is, is also part of the social engagement of the city. So we're excited that we're able to use um, these two special models as places for presentations and um, I think very much connect to this year's theme of sustainability. Um, and I would be remiss if in talking about the history of where we are that I did not acknowledge that the land that the Queens Museum stands in is occupied, unceded, seized territory of the Matinecock, Canarsi, Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware, the Nanticoc, Lenny Lenape, and the Ramapo Len Lenape peoples, and acknowledge that um, everywhere in this country uh, we are on borrowed land. And um, I, with that, I'd like to introduce Jen De Los Reyes, the uh, founder director of Open Engagement, to kick everything off. And thank you so much for being in our home, and we hope that you feel welcome. Good morning. All right. Welcome to the 10th Open Engagement Conference. Really hard to believe that we are all here right now. The planning for the very first Open Engagement began in 2006 in my basement studio. At the time, I was a graduate student and had just finished a residency at the kitchen here in New York where I encountered a handful of artists from around the world who were also making socially engaged art. It was really such an enriching and supportive experience to encounter all these people trying to do that work that I wanted to create a way to reconnect and expand that site. I then dedicated the rest of my time in graduate school to organizing the event that would eventually become Open Engagement. When OE began in 2007, I had never run a conference before. I learned through doing, and it was the most important part of my graduate education. It was self-organized, it was grassroots, it was a collective effort, and open engagement continues to be that to this day. The way that this conference is organized centers artists and practitioners, values multiple forms of knowledge, creates intergenerational spaces. It's a site that gives people opportunities. And above all, it is about creating a site of care for this field. I've learned over the years to not be ashamed of the fact that a lot of my work is about putting more love into the world. And I believe that this comes through with open engagement. We hear year after year that this does not feel like your usual conference. And I've heard many times from attendees that it feels like they are finally meeting their people. Over the years, we have seen this field of practice expand and grow. We have seen institutional change and channels of support for artists engaged in this important and critical work expand. I want to take a moment to thank our national consortium, who have not only been key in making the last three years of the conference possible, but who much more beyond their work on OE have been crucial in supporting the field, making space for radical work, and educating artists to foreground the social. While this institutional support has been integral, the truth is that open engagement could not happen without the tireless work of so many individuals. And in this moment, I'm feeling endlessly thankful to all the people who have made this site alongside me over the years, and in particular, the amazing team this year working hard to make this final conference happen. Thank you, Crystal Baxley, our amazing associate director who has worked on this since 2010 and could not have done so much of this without you. Latham Sierfoss, the assistant director, also all of these are incredible people. Ramona Law, Kira Gross, Max Gottlieb, Jade Thacker, Lauren Miranda, working hard on the design team, leading the charge, Danny Orendorf, Andreas Alejandro Chavez, and so many more. Including all of the people who participated in our community-based selection process here in New York and beyond that made the incredible program that you're going to experience this weekend. All of the volunteers, 
and all of you for being here with us. We truly have made this together. In the countdown to this conference, we invited 10 friends of open engagement to reflect on the 10 year anniversary. And in a response from Gretchen Combs, she laments on the loss of whimsy and intimacy in the conference over the years. As she put it, the quirky ones have grown up with the field. And while it's true that open engagement has become more and more professionalized over the years, I still think fondly about a time when Ted Purvis, longtime friend and ally of the conference, said that we were still punk. To me, this statement is about our spirit, our ethos, our values, and doing work that embodies all of those things in the world. Yesterday morning, our friend Randall Zott, in collaboration with the New York City Audubon Society, led a beautiful memorial walk in tribute to Ted. It was a moment for careful looking, deep listening, and coming together through an action inspired by Ted's love of birding and his belief that knowledge is built, formed, and shared out in the world that all education is inherently social. Ted was one of my graduate advisors on my thesis project, which was open engagement. And I'm proud that OE carries on these beliefs that Ted instilled in me and this project. I wanna share a piece of writing that Ted wrote reflecting on the movement of the hermit thrush that feels particularly fitting at this moment for open engagement as we think about what we have contributed and what the future might be for this site, if any. Quote, only recently have I considered the possibility that the song of the thrush is as fiercely beloved by the forest itself and that its trees and winds hold on to the song like a whisper and carry it along, repeating it every so often until the thrush moves through again. You will hear it as the last bit of light leaves the sky. But there is always one evening when it does not come back." End quote. And while OE might not return, I hope that all of you will continue to hold on to this work and that we will hear us come together in song at some point again in the future. Thank you. And I'm now gonna hand things over to the members of the OE family to let you know all the exciting things that are about to happen this weekend. Please give a warm welcome to Kira Gross. Hey everybody, um, this is my first conference. I'm super excited to be here. I'm gonna let you know about some of the things that are happening to support you and make your time here easy um, and simple. Uh, so going forth, if you have any questions or concerns, um, you lose your badge, you don't know where to go, OEHQ is right up here with our wonderful volunteers um, and our volunteer coordinator, Danny. Um, so definitely make use of that. Um, it'll be like the easiest. They're going to be the most up to date if anything is changing. So definitely, um, and it's really, you can't miss it too. Um, also on behalf of OE, I want to welcome all of our families. Um, we really try and be uh, supportive of intergenerational spaces. We kind of ask everybody to be supportive of that. Um, there's a really great quote that I'll read um, from prison abolitionist Jason Lydon of the Community Church of Boston. It said, kid noises are the sign of a growing movement, um, and OE really supports that. So um, we try also to be stroller friendly. You can get through the whole museum. You, you see elevators to our left that will get you upstairs, and also all of our bathrooms have changing stations, which is really nice. Um, yeah, so, and also along with that, we have youth activities that the Queens Museum is hosting, so if you have children, um, you can go to the OEHQ, and it'll kind of guide you um, through what the Queens Museum is offering to your children. And moving on to accessibility, um, OE tries really hard to make all of our spaces accessible. Um, this year, uh, thankfully, we do have many members and different places that we're hosting events. Um, so if you have any questions on accessibility, again, OEHQ is your place to be. Um, but in terms of the museum, um, you should be able to get through um, everywhere, and everywhere should have a ramp or a wheelchair accessibility. 
Okay, the only rule of OE is to keep your badge. I know it's like a flimsy piece of paper, but keep it close to you. Um, this will help you get to all of our parties and different events um, and after hours. If you lose it, go to OE, OE HQ again, um, but it'd be nice just to have this. The museum will be open during the conference, so um, you don't want to like, get mixed in with like people who are just here at the museum. Oh, so this is what it looks like. Pronouns. So also on these, you'll see a space for our pronouns. Um, we ask that everybody be mindful and not make assumptions. Um, and it's clearly right here. So if you have a question, you can just look at this. Um, so yeah, definitely have that on you. Um, restrooms. Um, you'll see many throughout this space. Um, we do support um, everybody using a bathroom that aligns with their gender identity. Um, so please feel free to use whichever bathroom is affirming to you. Um, and food, after this you'll probably be really hungry, always work really hard to make sure we have lots of food for everybody. The cafe will be well stocked with boxed lunches that will accommodate vegans and vegetarians or meat eaters that are at an accessible price. Um, we'll also have food truck vendors out in the front from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and those will be full of goodies, so definitely take time to do that. Um, and those will be here from 9 to 5 and please have cash on hand, that would be the easiest way. Um, but I'd like to introduce um, Mona, and she will tell you about our after hours programs. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ramona, or Mona, um, and I want to talk to you about Dine with OE, which is our dinner conversation program that's happening this evening um, across Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan um, from 7 to 8 30. So we have about um, 10 dinners that are happening, um, and we've been organizing them with artists and activists um, from around New York and beyond. Um, and we still have two open this evening, so I do want to shout out to those two dinners, which are Shape Shifting Practices in Uncertain NYC and Singing to the Choir, which is about Ursula K. Le Guin. So even if you're not totally interested in the topic or it's not the one that you would have wanted, we really do want to fill these up. So I encourage you to do that, and they're hosted at restaurants that are going to be serving delicious food as part of the ticket price. Um, I also wanted to um, let you all know about a, another drop-in dinner hosted by Party Noir, which is a collective based in Chicago. And um, that dinner is called Black, Queer, and Joyful, and it's um, about funding black femmes. Um, so uh, that, and that dinner is gonna be hosted at Soul Sips, and um, that's in Brooklyn, and that dinner is open only to uh, black and brown folks across the gender spectrum. Um, there you go. Okay, so tonight um, we have other after hours activities. Um, every night we're sort of ending with um, acts of joy. So, um, and we believe that transformative acts of change are made possible through accessible blueprints of the utopias we strive for. So tonight um, our party is a party at the Knockdown Center, which is in Queens, um, and we will present an evening of performances and dancing with the opening act, Lycanthia, followed by a disc, disc woman showcase with Bearcat and Rio Bamba in conjunction with the conference. So you should bring your um, badge to that to get in. Our doors will open at 9, performances will start at 10. Um, and if anyone that you want to bring wants to come that doesn't have a pass to the conference, it's just $5 to get in. Um, lastly, our closing event is tomorrow night at the Flux Factory, which is also in Queens, um, and that's 7 to midnight. Um, join us for a tender turn up. Um, and so we have some OE staff performing, Jade with choir, Latham is DJing, um, and Kira and I will be working the bar. So, um, and also we will be um, carried into the future with that party noir um, and lots of dancing. If you get there between seven to nine, we will have a hosted dinner, um, and that is free to all of you, and we'd love to feed you. Um, and then, uh, again, it's $5 for anyone that doesn't have a pass. So I'd like to invite Jade Thacker out. She's the local liaison and organized all the open houses. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm the New York City local liaison, I live here, um, and as such, I'd like to thank all the current uh, New York City partners and 
um, institutions that hosted open houses, as well as the Metropolitan Museum of Art for their awesome support of our pre-conference initiative on Thursday. Um, yes, so this year at Open Engagement, we have some incredible merch, which I definitely recommend you check out, designed by many of the artists that supported the Open Engagement team over the years. So definitely head to OEHQ upstairs to check that out. We have tote bags over the last 10 years, including new ones this year that are pretty gorgeous. Uh, some enamel pins, we have buttons that are specially designed, um, a book by Bad at Sports, um, and packs of buttons, all kinds of really cool things. So get some OE stuff while you still can. Um, yes, yeah, so spaces. Uh, everybody has a program, um, and in such early on, this is your program by the way, it's in your uh, packets. So early on there will be a map which um, will take you through all the various locations throughout the museum where sessions will take place. Um, this here is the main atrium, right behind me is the panorama, behind you is the watershed. Um, so if you just head to, I believe it's page eight and nine, you'll find the maps and you should be able to get where you need to go checking that out. Um, some programs are taking place in the New York Hall of Science, um, and this is about a 10 minute walk from here, so just give yourself enough time to get there. Um, if you ever aren't sure where you're going, keep an eye out for the big blue balloons that say OE, that should help you find uh, where you're looking for. Um, knockdown Center. <laughs> yeah, so these are some locations um, uh, for the parties tonight. Tonight we'll be at the Knockdown Center, this is the address. I'm sure you can look it up on your phone, but feel free to take a screenshot or a photo now if you'd like on your cell phone. Um, tomorrow is at Flux Factory. Uh, moving a little quickly here, my apologies. Um, yeah, so in general, uh, everything you really need to know today will be in your program. Um, and if you ever have any questions and you, you, know, you don't know where you're going or you're you know, not sure what to do, just check out OEHQ up these stairs. Um, again, this is a picture of your map, which is also printed in your program. Um, this is the Queen's Museum itself. All of these things, you know, you have accessible. Um, yeah, so this is your program. It is gorgeous. If you go to page 14, um, where you have the blue borders around the page, this is where you'll find the program for all of today and tomorrow's activities. Um, and there is a key up at the top right which outlines, you know, sort of what you're attending. Um, the circle indicates a conversation dinner. These are programs taking place this evening that are special hosted dinners. Um, you can sign up, you've probably already signed up for these. If there are available spots and you are interested tonight, you should definitely check out OEHQ and we can get you set up. Um, the rainbow indicates after hours events, tonight and tomorrow. This little triangle is a featured presentation. This. Uh, I believe that's a hexagon, it's a project. Equal sign, parallel session. So what that means is that there's gonna be several things taking place at the same time. So you'll have to choose selectively uh, which program you'd like to attend. Um, it's gonna be difficult, but I know you can do it. Um, this diamond is open platform and uh, square is a training. So just take a look there. And again, any questions, OEHQ. Um, if you need the Wi-Fi, the network is QM-Guest, and there's no password, so feel free to get on there. Um, social media would be awesome if you wanted to tag us or follow along, so feel free to, you know, take a photo now of the screens or, you know, um, ask upstairs if you want to get some hashtags or anything like that. Okay, so thank you guys so very much. Um, Crystal Baxley is the Associate Director, and I'm very pleased to introduce her. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here and feeling a little emotional. This is my ninth of 10 open engagements and I can't believe it's happening right here, right now. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our curatorial statement. Um, open Engagement 2018 seeks to explore and honor the ways that systems and actions are connected, how they fail and how they thrive. 
How do artists support themselves in their communities? How do we do so in impactful ways that foster new parag paradigms of inclusion, nuance, safety, criticality, health, agency, justice, and purpose for all? How are artists and their institutions impacting the environment, culture, economics, technology, politics, social dynamics, national and international law? How do we match our rage with equally impactful modalities of care and reparation? And so our full curatorial statement, which was written collaboratively by myself, Jen, and Latham, is in your program along with everything else, everything that you need should all be there. And I wanted to take a moment to let you know about our call for collaborators. Um, this is our last open engagement as far as we know. We don't know what the future holds for us. And we believe that it's our responsibility to include this community in that decision-making process. We can't know what's best for the field as individuals. We need to figure out what it is. We would like to figure out what it is together. And so on the back page of your program is our full call for collaborators, which again we wrote collectively for everyone. And we turn to our community to ask how should we move forward. We want to continue to serve as a site of care for our field but we can't do so without direct impact from its practitioners. What could OEB in the future? What's here? What's missing? How can we generate resources that ensure everyone involved is valued? What do you want? What do you need? What do you want to give? How can we be a safe space for radical thought? How can we be in support? The artists, activists, writers, organizers, witches, and punks that we want to be and that we want to see in the world. How can we work to dismantle the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy? How can we support alternative economies and what structures are there to be imagined and enacted? These are just some of the questions that we've come up with and surely there are a million more. Anything that you'd like to share with us, your thoughts, your time, your resources to help move OE forward, we would be so grateful to receive. And we're gonna be sending out exit surveys at the end of this conference. You can also email us anytime with your thoughts um, and we're gonna be setting up an anonymous Google form on our website in case that is the way that you'd like to share your feel thoughts and feelings with us. And so there's a lot more there. I just wanted to point that out, kind of speak to, we're gonna be holding this um, really close to us as we're moving forward in the weekend and we wanted to bring you all in on that as well. And now I have, I believe that's it for this slideshow, and now I have the immense honor of introducing Lucy Lepard, who's gonna be our future presenter today. Um, Lucy Lepard is a writer, artist, a writer, activist, sometimes curator, author of 24 books on contemporary art activism, feminism, place, photography, archaeology, and land use. Most recently, undermining, undermining a wild ride through land use, politics, and art in a changing West, which came out in 2014, time and time again, on Chaco and Mesa Verde with photographer Peter Goyne in Down Country, the Tano of Galisteo Basin. 1250 to 1782, as well as Mixed Blessings, New Art in a Multicultural America, and The Lore of the Local, Senses of Place in a Multi-Centered Society. Lucy's the recipient of nine honorary degrees, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a landing grant, among other awards. She lives off the grid in rural New Mexico, where for 20 years she has edited the monthly community newsletter, El Puente de Galiseo. So honored to welcome Lucy Lepard. for their loaning us their land, but somehow you did that. We, we've been doing this acknowledgement of Native American lands in the West and in Canada for many years, but I'm so glad to see that it's gotten much more generalized now and it's happening all over the place, which is nice. And in fact, this slide is by Alan Michelson, who's a Mohawk, used to work with Repo History. Woo! <laughs> uh, and it's... Uh, you can, I hope you can read it. The slides are kind of small. I don't. I mean, if I read everything that are in these slides, we'll all go nuts. So, um, so if you can't read it, I'm sorry. Our <laughs> blankets for your beaver, our beads for your mink, our guns for your fox, and so forth. And uh, before I start ranting, um, I'm curious about the geographic representation of this audience. Uh, it, it's probably the Northeast is best represented, but. The, can I see hands from everybody who's from the Northeast? That makes sense. Uh, what about the Southeast? 
How about the Southwest? Yeah. <laughs> and the West Coast? And Midwest in the Montana and so forth? Ah, that's interesting. <laughs> okay, just, just strictly curiosity. And how do I push the slides? Let's see. Just, just this. <laughs> So anyway, when I started working on this talk, it was even more of a flat-out rant. I was trying to cover all the issues raised in these precarious times, because of course I was gobsmacked by recent events as the rest of you. And eventually I just gave up on the laundry list, so I apologize if I don't hit on your particular issue. Until November, 19th, or until November 2016, I thought my generation had some successes among our failures. But seeing so many of them collapse has been a ghastly experience. Now all I have to offer is unanswered or unanswerable questions, like the title of this talk, which I actually used recently in a World War III illustrated uh, comic, or graphic novel, graphic magazine. Uh, the, so the question was, so the title of this talk is, what do we want to say and how do we want to say it? This is an old piece by group material, Dazi Bao, it was a poster's large posted in Union Square. And I put it up here in memory of Tim Rollins, who passed away recently and was a very important member of our community. So, and also, what do, what do we want to say it with, and who do we want to say it with, and who do we want to say it to, and what is it? Conventional wisdom, has it that art speaks for itself, so even the goal of saying something beyond the artwork can be contentious. But when I was curating a climate change show 11 years ago, Newton and the late lamented Helen Harrison cited a scientist who told them that as artists they could ask questions and even propose answers that no scientist could say yet in public. And James Baldwin said, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions which have been hidden by the answers. That's an amazing gift responsibility. This is a piece by Mary Miss in that show I did called Weather Report in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, she, she worked with a hydrologist to notice, to know where the floods could come when climate change really kicked in. And weirdly enough, a couple of years later, these, these blue, the actual paint tin caps were all over town, something they did get a huge flood and Mary proved to be a totally predictive artist. So talking to artists' friends, I found that one of the issues that most interested them was how far outside the art world can artists work and still be satisfied that they're making art and still make a living outside of that sandbox we were all nurtured in. It's not easy to totally disavow recognition by the market and the institutions. And if you've managed to do it, we probably don't know what you're doing. Does that matter? Is it still art? Who cares? This is Hans Hacke's uh, recent piece for Document 14. Maybe it's just a personal obsession, but I've long advocated for art that escapes the art world and elopes with life. Social energy is not yet recognized as art. And for decades I've written wish wishfully about escape attempts, art workers trying to break out of the art world. And they usually draw them back in, as I have been over and over again. Maybe I failed to escape the art world because that's where I belonged. Certainly, I found my community among the other escape artists, those who led the way out of the art world toward life. This is a photograph by Susan Mizellis in northern Iraq. A few years ago at a photo conference, I challenged photographers to give up their relatively recent status as high artists and return to the medium's freer, more open, more functional, and accessible legacy. The ways in which photography has pushed the boundaries of representation in all directions has allowed it to infiltrate every aspect of the high art world. But I wonder if that's a good idea. Certainly the art world is no less a commercial venue than what's called commercial photography. Objects of art with a capitalist A, somebody said, have been exponentially expanding for decades, paralleling the national obesity epidemic. 
And I wondered if photographers who enjoy far more and farther ranging possibilities than the makers of painting, sculpture, video, or installation do, didn't feel kind of claustrophobic when welcomed into and then confined in the art world. Sometimes I worry that recognition as art can be the kiss of death for worthy projects. Um, though, of course, it does provide artists a living, which is kind of important. This is a Chris Jordan photograph from the, done in, in the um, Pacific of birds who eat solid gas like plastic. Was it's not enough to claim that we're on the side of the future, that the art we make or support is operating beyond the bounds, though usually not the reach, of an increasingly bloated and elitist art world. Yet even collaboration, which I see as the social expansion of collage, isn't easy for art workers. Self-censorship in today's art world can sometimes be more dangerous than institutional censorship. We're trained to stay in the sandbox at the same time that we're encouraged to stray from the sandbox, but not so far that the art world won't know we're still out there. On the other hand, if you have a high profile, it's easier to get your outreaching art funded. It's a delicate balance, as you all know. Uh, the British Collective Forensic Architecture was nominated for the Turner Prize just recently. They were surprised because they said, we don't even consider ourselves to be artists. Their mission is to produce visual evidence for international prosecutors, human rights organizations, and political and environmental justice groups around the world. And they were wary of becoming part of the art financial complex. Yet they can be seen as, an act, as part of the activist branch of public practice that is art that's issue-oriented and grassroots-based, with artists working out in the world or in communities with and not just for the people who live there. It's based in subversion on one hand and empowerment on the other. And I'd add empathy, generosity, and respectful exchange on the other three hands. This is, after all, a collective endeavor. The controlling factors are the collaborators and our audiences focused on the context in which the projects take place and how well, how sensitively, and how effectively the artists make these connections. Sustainability, like the environment, is all about context, and decontextualization can be counterproductive. This is uh, Rick Lowe's Row Houses, which I'm sure you all know about. Caroline Ward has suggested that the promotion of the concept of social practice to the MFA level has decontextualized its mission. And I have to admit, I'm not really fond of the term social practice. It sounds so clinical. But for years, we've been warned again, warning against the artist parachuting into unfamiliar territory. And Rick Lowe has famously suggested that MFAs in social practice simply gentrify long-standing community-based arts. And it's only when public practice art school graduates enter communities that they finally do get an education. Note the recent fracases in New York's Chinatown and LA's Boyle Heights. Rick Lowe takes the hard line. He says the only standard for judging socially engaged art should be how much justice it generates in the world. But isn't spreading the word also a really good idea? Uh, this is by Chrissy Orr in New Mexico. Uh, it's a project she did several years ago called El Otro Lado, about immigration coming out from mostly Mexico. Socially involved art workers, like everybody else, have to choose among the tsunami of issues around sustainability that we should be weighing in on, fighting for. But sometimes it feels like we're spread so thin we'll blow away. As a Southwesterner, my list is headed by climate change, water, indigenous rights, saving public lands, and the heartbreaking fates of the youthful and documented immigrants of DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, whose lives have been put in terrible limbo because they had the courage to risk their futures by speaking out against unfair immigration policies. How many of you are working on DACA? Anybody? Of course, the rest of the endless litany is equally important. Racism, poverty, incarceration, guns, Me Too, Time's Up, homophobia, police brutality, Middle Eastern wars and Palestinian rights, deadly pollution on land and sea, the toll of fossil fuel extraction, race, gender, class, religion. Oi. 
What did I miss? <laughs> Confronted by this endless list, we have to focus hard as it may be to choose. We have to ask ourselves, what do we want to say, and how do we want to say it, and to whom? This is a piece by Ed Epping, who's been working on incarceration for a long time. It's a very complicated project. This is a, actually a target that is apparently sold as a target. And then he's imprinted the Fourth Amendment across the image. Suzanne Lacey, who is my longtime social practice mentor, who works, as she says, at the intersection of community development and visual art, talks about creating citizen artists. She's a genius at contextualizing non-art contexts, at choreographing collective expression, and bringing unheard voices to the foreground, if not exactly the center. This is a piece that she's been doing in Northern England uh, called Sounds of Hope, where she brings, it's in an old mill building, and she brings together all the various relatively new communities, so in, I think it's a Sufi group or something there. Um, and, and works with music stuff. It's in Briarfield, Lancashire. So Susanna said, if she hadn't been interested in addressing the art world, she would have gone into politics. And she credits Alan Capro with showing her the advantages of putting life into the gallery and putting the gallery into life. She talks about not starting with an idea, but arriving at the idea as it's generated by those at the table. These days, Lacey's planning for a solo show at the San Francisco Museum, and she's struggling over how to create visual impact in a museum while maintaining authenticity within the community. She says, the art world is where I get to talk, the community is where I get to listen. A recent panel in Santa Fe on feminism and intersectionality emphasized radical inclusiveness and made several points about entering a community that is not our own. Take part, but don't take the lead. Curiosity is good, but not voyeurism. Honesty is good, condescension isn't. You can't fake empathy. Have we educated ourselves about unfamiliar cultures? Listen, do they want our help? Who are they and who are we? Shouldn't it be just we? This slogan from South Africa is in a poster by Ricardo Morales hangs over my desk and then has for years. Uh, nothing about us, without us, is for us. This simple statement is immensely important. Nothing about us, without us, is for us. Artists working in communities have to work with communities, and sometimes social success means aesthetic sacrifice. One example of this I saw firsthand uh, in the 70s was when Charles Simmons was working with mobilization for youth on the Lower East Side, and he was designing a park in a vacant lot based on his imaginary landscapes inhabited by invisible little people. So the art idea was this. This is a collage of the, of the project. And this is what it finally ended up by being, because he worked with the community, and they wanted a slide, and they wanted a mural, and so on, and the, and the, the so beautiful art idea vanished. But it was a great success. This is Alicia Wormsley's piece. We're still a long way from achieving the gender and racial fluidity that we've begun to contemplate in recent decades. But Black Lives Matter has changed the dialogue and helped the ante, just as Me Too and Time's Up are resurrecting feminist issues and some real soul searching about whiteness. Here's a kind of long but important quote from artist cinematographer Arthur Jaffa. He says, how come people can't see themselves, whether or not it looks just like them? It's what black people do because most of what we see are white people. It's what women have developed the muscle to do because mostly what they see are men. It's what gay people are able to do because mostly what they see is heteronormative stuff. It's a muscle that everybody needs to develop, the ability to see themselves in someone else's circumstances without having to paint that person white, make that person straight or a man. How can you see yourself in the other? That's what it really comes down to, empathy. And this is a piece that many of you may know by Chloe Bass. It's the, the book of everyday instruction. And it's a piece on, she works with intimacy, with understanding, and definitely with empathy. I love the sort of connective look of that. 
This is by Peggy Diggs, uh, obviously modeled on Adrian Piper's calling cards. It's a card. It's a series she's been working on for a long time about whiteness. I, I've always regretted the fact that when I wrote Mixed Blessings in the late 80s, I, that just as I was finishing it, I thought, I should make the last, last chapter about whiteness. And I was just too lazy and too tired, and I didn't do it. And, and it would have been a, a definitely a good idea. There's no question that we need thicker skins in order to really get racism in our society, to really understand racism in our society. I'm always torn between staying safe, focusing on what I know, and venturing into areas where I not, may not be welcome and where my ignorance will be exposed. I'm not entirely sure why the terms multiculturalism and identity politics are so discredited. I know the right wing has had a lot to do with it. Since they, they're terms that lead to the consideration of diversity, hybridity, crossovers, and intersectionality. The favorite term these days for working across boundaries, even across walls. This is uh, Kampen Hanga, Hans Kampen Luger, um, who was raised on Standing Rock, and this is a piece he did at Standing Rock. Mirrors facing the cops and everybody else. He got the, uh, I think he got the idea from some a Ukrainian protest when old women and children took their mirrors out to the riot police so they could see themselves. In Open Engagement's 2017 curatorial statement, Arundhati Roy was quoted as saying, there's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. In the last few years, groups formerly perceived as voiceless have stood up and finally been heard. Indigenous people in Standing Rock and in the Idle No More movement have raised consciousness not only about pipelines, clean water, and treaty rights, but suddenly the art world knows something about Indians, which is rare. <laughs> the students the students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High in Florida are calling out long-standing political failures on gun control and the obsolete Second Amendment. We have a militia, it's called the National Guard, we do not need teachers of the guy next door. This is by Peter Cooper. And did you know, it's sort of interesting that Douglas herself, I read recently, was a lifelong activist. I, I didn't know that, and it's kind of fascinating that this happened to be a horrible coincidence that this happened at school named after her. Anyway, let's hope the amplification holds up, that these voices don't fade back into oblivion and into inaudibility. How many of you are working on gun control? Should be more. <laughs> For decades, socially engaged artists have talked about reaching broader audiences, something that the Tunisian French public artist J.R. has actually achieved. This is a piece of his of the U.S.-Mexico border. He has a rural counterpart in Chip Thomas, who's an African-American physician who's worked on the Navajo Nation for some 25 years. And he's anonymously been doing these things all along. Wheat pasting walls, photographs around the reservation. He calls himself Jetsonorama. As Navajo musician and post-commodity collective member Raven Chacon says of his own work in museums and concert halls and on the Navajo Nation, it's not for everybody, but it is for anybody. And that's probably as good as it gets. Put it out there, see if it works. If it doesn't work, try something different. The dilemma about the artist's choice between remaining independent and powerless or being co-opted by the powerful mainstream art world is decades long. Perhaps the toughest question we have to ask ourselves is what do we value most? Individual success or collective social victory, no matter how apparently small? Over the years, a lot of smart things have been said about the possibilities for artists to be in museums and still take on issues, though it may take, de take decades to be accepted. Conceptual art was one of my, my major learning experiences because Seth Siegel, a colleague of mine, uh, just decided to bypass the museums in, in the late 60s. And this was not something that anybody had ever thought of. You know, you had to go through the museum, the critic, the gallery, and so forth. And he just started publishing things, and the artists started doing things out there. And we had ways of letting people know that the stuff was out there. An exhibition could be taking place around the whole world at the same time, uh, and, and 
you'd know it was there because you had a little tiny catalog or Xerox book or something. Anyway, that was artist books kind of came along in that wave too. So it, actually about being taking decades to be accepted, ask Hans Hacker, who has always named names, which is a basic taboo within the mainstream. This is the piece he did in 1971, I think, on the Guggenheim Museum Trustees, the famous piece after they had uh, canceled his one-person show at the museum. He's managed to remain in the more, more often European art context by being very thoroughly thorough in studying his targets from outside corporations, politics, cities, nations. And of course, you can also be making powerful abstract art that opens up perceptions of our world, of the world generally, and still take responsibility for your place in it, like Harmony Hammond's veiled but powerful reflections on querying abstraction. This is by the Yes Men, who I'm assuming you all know about. Rather than spending a lot of energy on how to get artists' names and arts out into the world, it can be more productive to team up with the progressive organizers and activists already committed to the issues. They can educate us, save us time, and make our work a lot more effective. Although sadly, they often don't want to deal with artists, they don't trust artists. It's not always easy to convince your natural collaborators that your art is valuable to their cause. Instead of being grateful for your proposals that might make their work a lot more compelling, organizations are often wary of partnering with artists or, and often they're fed up with artistic egos. They may not know how effectively a good artist can undermine repetitive didacticism and jolt consciousness with humor or striking visuals. I remember an early 80s march on Washington against U.S. intervention in Central America where a group of us had spent a lot of time and energy working up a cultural presentation, including a huge inflatable Pac-Man. Remember, I can't believe I ate it all. Anyway, everything was behind schedule, and the March organizers said, well, let's just cut the cultural stuff. And we prevailed, but it was very disheartening. Donations to art auctions for good causes are much more popular than not among artists. I was at a round table last year at an art institute where a brilliant and overworked immigration lawyer admitted that the dreamers she was protecting needed money and legal help, not art. She was very firm about that. This is by Future Farmers, their Victory Garden piece in San Francisco. So belatedly, I'm kind of getting around to this, this weekend's subject, sustainability. Eco-art scholar Timothy Morton reportedly said that whenever he hears the word, he reaches for his sunscreen. Sustainability has become a catchword, a truism, the fate of so many good ideas planted in the wrong soils. Maybe environmental justice is a better term. This is another future farmer's piece of donkeys, that, computers, or whatever. I think they are. Or are they record players? I don't know what they are. Anyway. Typewriters. Oh, yes, I recognize them. <laughs> I worked on one much longer than most people did. <laughs> the, uh, so um, here again, what do we want to sustain? Certainly not the status quo. Western so-called civilization, all civilization. How about the entire planet and everything on it? How do we do that? We as a society are just beginning to understand that social sustainability is inextricably linked to ecological sustainability which is a basic necessity for survival and for public practice of art. Like public practice, sustainability is dependent on empathy and downsizing, both of which are hard to achieve in a racist capitalist society based entirely on unsustainable growth, non-stop for-profit expansion and to hell with the consequences. Growth of everything from mansions to nuclear arsenals to strip mines to corporate conglomerates to ever larger and more expansive expensive installations and artworks. E.F. Schumacher's influential 1973 book, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered, occupies a small but beautiful place in our pantheon. In this country, small is no longer just beautiful, it's crucial. It's not just a matter of tiny houses, of urban infill, biking, resource conservation, environmental protection, recycling, Planned Parenthood. 
It's a psychological impetus that's needed everywhere. So downsize or die. That was the original title for this talk, but I changed that. <laughs> <laughs> halt or at least slow growth until some sort of sustainable justice for both people and the planet is reached. This is by Beverly Natus, who is with us tonight. Uh, part of her Eden Reframed project, a community project on Bashan Island in Washington State. But let's take a moment, this moment, to salute organic growth for... <laughs> yes. <laughs> to celebrate organic growth. <laughs> it's spring, seeds are sprouting, and a lot of you are just beginning your activist lives. And of course, when we're talking about inclusivity, about uniting whole communities, the bigger the scale, the broader the reach, the better. Part of downsizing for socially engaged and eco-artists is conceiving of one's art within the context of unsustainable resources like water and fossil fuels. Building toward the future instead of planning for posterity, spending time in our own communities. We're still searching for our -capital, post-capitalist self, an alternative to the rugged individualism of manifest destiny, but an alternative that allows working people a decent living and human rights which are, alas, rapidly being downsized. This is a piece that uh, was part of 350.org that we did in Santa Fe a few, a few years ago. It's the, the totally dry Santa Fe River, which is even drier now. Uh, we, everybody had bath mats and blue tarps and so on, and we put the water back in the river. And it's photographed from the uh, from a satellite. And I've always loved this piece. I don't know who's responsible for it, but I've found the thing. It's here in the city somewhere, I think. Lot reserved for future internment camp. This is a, a subtle, small-scale piece. I have great faith in small-scale projects and their potential to spread into much larger spheres. This is Lorraine O'Grady's uh, Art Is dot dot dot. This again was in the, uh, I guess, 1985. She had a float that went through Harlem and then people had frames on the, on the float and they'd, they'd jump off and frame the audience. And the whole idea, of course, is that it, uh, out of the white cube, out of the white audience, bring art to a, a totally different context. Oh, I guess that was, sorry. Anyway, the strongest, uh, Public practice, like activism, starts from a specific location, from consciously lived experience, but it has to move on out from there in a kind of ripple effect. If you don't know your hood, you're likely to either idealize or disparage its inhabitants. Fail to recognize threats and choose the wrong solutions is the basis of your art. So, where do you live? What's your center? How far out do the ripples go? Are you following them? Or are you remaining at the center and holding the reins? Who are you working with? Other artists, community members with whom you may have little in common until you forge alliances over issues that affect everyone? Who do you live with? Dispossessed locals? Deracinated newcomers? Grumpy landowners? Artists? Opioid addicts? Rich part-timers? Stray dogs? Abandoned horses? Feral cats? Threatened wildlife? Too damn many bunnies? <laughs> this is a problem we have. I'm sure you don't have that here. <laughs> Uh, New Mexico farmer and novelist Stan Crawford says that global warming and climate change mean we all have to work harder at working together. For some of us, the best way to deal with the onslaught of urgent issues is trying to strengthen our local community. After decades of organizing, wheat pasting, protesting, and urging artists into the streets, I moved to a tiny, semi-rural New Mexico village 25 years ago. And my activism consists of county community planning, water and cultural resource protection, fighting drought development and fossil fuel extraction. This is my driveway. <laughs> I hauled water for many years and I finally got over the community system, which I'm on the board of to now. Three of my last four books are on local archaeology and history. I found that a concentration on place, which can't be conflated with land, site, or landscape, can bring everything into focus, including politics. This is a photograph by Ed Branny of the Galistair Basin where I live. 
And this is a, a still from a Sue Friedrich film in Brooklyn, I think Williamsburg. The gentrification. Too. So this may not resonate with loft dwellers and Brooklynites and so forth, but it may sound like I've gone soft. Urban strategies on place tend to be different, but the issues are the same. And believe me, on some levels, it's a lot more challenging to work in a very small community where everybody knows everything you're doing at every moment. <laughs> and they want to know how much you're being paid for it. <laughs> this is uh, a, one of my favorite rural artists, uh, Natasha Mayers and her, all her, her colleagues in North Whitefield, Maine. And they do an amazing July 4th float every year about a different, different issue. So gentrification is as common in rural as in urban areas, though its face is different. Art workers settling in little villages or barrios inadvertently change a community. The issues that affect the once rural village, population of 260 people where I live, are certainly as global as they are local. But it's the local that's visible. It's the local that we have a chance to affect. This is a, our local cemetery and a brand new, no, a relatively new, very modern house built by an Englishman next door to it. And this is the same cemetery from the other side, which is our, our water system, which uh, brings the whole idea of water as life. I always need that much closer, right at the cemetery. Rural New Mexico. One of the poorest states in the Union, we always say thank God for Mississippi because they're always just one slot down from us, <laughs> is uh, where the diminishing numbers of elders speak Spanish as their first language. Sometimes it seems like another planet. One old Hispano gentleman in my village told me kindly that when I got old and sick, I'd probably want to go back to my own country. And he's right, I immigrated from a foreign country, lower Manhattan. So I've heard from friends, oh, that was supposed to be that one, sorry. I've heard from friends coming from generations of deracination, they're often Jewish, but also Middle Eastern, African, Asian, that it's hard to work with rooted communities when one can identify no home place of one's own. I insisted in a 1997 book called The Lure of the Local that wherever we find ourselves, even for short periods, we have to take responsibility for that place as long as we're there. I talk about senses of place, plural, and I think that's very important and a much better idea than sense of place. There isn't one. Listening to the stories of longtime occupants of the places where we live or work is one way of knowing where we've landed for however short or long time. And this is the this is the view out my window. As I wrote this, I was looking out the window at arid arid rangeland not yet broken up into ranchettes a shallow, intermittent stream we call a river, and mountains where the mining scars are slowly disappearing. It's becoming unaffordable for descendants of those who courageously settled this isolated and then dangerous region two centuries ago. It's also home to beleaguered creatures losing their habitat, their migration routes, their lives. How can artists help change the way humans relate to nature and to each other? Uh, this is by... Uh, Michal Rovner, she, who has actually shown in Chelsea at the moment. I, th I think it's night and cameras, these creatures. We share DNA with every form of life on the planet. It's not too late for humanity to consider the legal rights of nature herself. Indigenous people are demanding rights for nature and for themselves, from India to Ecuador to New Zealand, where a 400,000 acre national park taken from the Maoris has been designated as a person not property. Land belongs to itself. What a concept. Public lands, and uh, this is obviously a point, of this, that's the Grand Canyon on the right. Nature, which of course includes us, should not be a commodity that we can sell off to the highest bidder. Ryan Zinke notwithstanding. It's a community we belong to and harm at our own risk. An example. Pollution causes three times as many deaths as AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. As things race out of control and we do nothing, as we destroy our environment, run out of water, witness species extinction, climate change, and so forth, 
We should know that similar catastrophes have happened to the planet many times before. The blip in time that is the human race will not be missed, but will miss us a lot. Everyone's coming down the, everything's coming down the pipe far faster than we imagined it could. I used to worry about my grandsons and future generations down the line. Now I worry about my son, who's in his early 50s. This is Mar-a-Lago underwater. This era, called since 2000 the Anthropocene, is also dubbed the Misanthropocene, or the Era Mosaic, an era of loneliness and isolation as species go extinct in desertion or desertification, as the oceans rise and the groundwaters sink. The sense of urgency is so overwhelming it can stop us in our tracks and make us hide our heads in the sand. Sand, by the way, is another endangered material. Sea level around Manhattan is projected to rise six feet within a century. Huge cities can't build a wall the way the wealthy do to protect their seaside summer homes. And as we know from East and West Germany, Israel, Palestine, and the US-Mexico border, walls are not the answer. New Mexico, the momentous in New Mexico, the momentous challenge is lack of water. With the over-exploitation of the Colorado and Rio Grande rivers sharing with Texas and Mexico, now in the hands of the Supreme Court. This is the Rio Grande just below Socorro, which is toward southern New Mexico. At this very moment, it's totally dry. It was particularly weird to hear the dreaded Secretary of the Interior come up with an idea that first surfaced in the late 1800s with John Wesley Powell dividing BLM districts by bioregional boundaries along river systems and natural features instead of political borders. He dropped that fast, of course, thinking uh, it was far too much for his fellow Republicans and probably all the Democrats, too. It's coming down to a race between humans and climate change to see who can get rid of us first. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists just advanced their doomsday clock to two minutes to midnight, citing increasing concerns over nuclear weapons and climate change. That's the closest it's been to terminal disaster since 1953, when the US and USSR exploded thermonuclear weapons. And it was reported before the release of Trump's nuclear posture review, which significantly increases the dangers. This is a New Mexico project group made fake canisters of nuclear waste. We are, we are one of the great nuclear waste sites in the country, uh, protesting that our state is this. This is by Yolanda Lopez. It's an old piece that is all too pertinent now. So how many of you are working on denuclearization? At the risk of sounding retrograde at this conference that's focused on a sustainable future, I want to end with the necessity to think about history. Not just the past, but the continuous present, as Gertrude Stein put it. It's that stuff we take for granted that's all too often misrepresented, misrepresented, the lies that haunt us and hold us hostage. George Orwell said in his dystopian book, 1984, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. History is surfacing more often these days as we try to imagine our futures, figure out where we went wrong, and look back from Trump's US at lessons from Nazi Germany or Franco Spain or Berlusconi's Italy. This is a piece by Janet Koenig did years ago, and it's so perfect for this monument moment. Uh, it's, it, you recognize the Teddy Roosevelt monument outside the Museum of Natural History, the American Museum. and. Uh, but in the original, Teddy Roosevelt is big and the Indian and, and black guy are little, and this is reverses that. Uh, Claudia Rankin writes, you can't put the past behind you. It's buried in you. It's turned your flesh into its own cupboard. She was talking specifically about the African American past, but the genocide of Native Americans is another unacknowledged part of every American's past as are all the other outrages committed on the bodies of those not in the majority, including the body of the earth. Instead of spending money on denying the past, the National Coalition Against Censorship suggests inviting contemporary artists to create works in response to those who want to censor memories. 
engage the public in discussion, invite communities to reflect on how we remember and reconstruct history. That's the end of their quote. Artists can create history and challenge it by telling stories of resilience that give us hope and courage. Some of us advocate destruction of offensive monuments to evildoers. Others recommend their removal to museums as artifacts of an unlimited past. These, both of those, these images are from the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama that Brian Stevenson just, just found an amazing place. But a small Italian town called Bolzano had a better idea to use each one of these abominations as a teaching moment. Keep the mo monuments in situ and then get artists, historians, lawyers, community activists to work on a public reply. In this case, to a relief celebrating Mussolini. So they ended up by superimposing a neon quote from Hannah Arendt, nobody has the right to obey. And I think this is a real challenge to artists working today to make a public statement rather than just getting rid of these things. This is a, a very much a case of that. The piece on the your sorry, anyway, uh, is the one that says Savage is by Charlene Teeters, who's a native Spokane uh, Indian. And she is documenting something that happened in Santa Fe, the, the obelisk in the center of the Santa Fe Plaza. One day some guy came along so this was years ago, and just uh, casually, looked like a workman, casually hopped over the fence and cut out the word savage. It was the, ob the obelisk said something to the effect of, you know, in memory of their brave soldiers who got rid of the terrible savages. And so this, this uh, apparently city worker came and just cut out savages. And so Charlene made a big piece that was outside our, our state capitol for, for a couple of years. Uh, commemorating the savages and people, mostly Native people, put um, mem memorabilia in the, in the adobe monument. But I thought that was another extraordinary moment of people not even, I mean, a lot of people don't even know the savage was gone from the obelisk, but she brought it back <coughs> over and showed what was going down. So the movement has taken its own form in the Southwest where Protests have erupted over the years in Santa Fe's touristic fiesta, celebrating the so-called bloodless reconquest in 1692 to 96, when the Spanish reclaimed New Mexico after 13 years of a successful Pueblo revolt. And especially in, in north central New Mexico, where the trauma of settler colonialism is still raw, given our large population of indigenous people and Latino and Anglo invaders. I mean, the, the, the Latinos have plenty to complain about being invaded themselves, and some New York Times article said at one point, asked this guy who was a revolutionary from um, Tierra Maria, he, he said, well, you, you Spanish don't have any real claim to this because you took all this land from the Indians. And he said, si, pero quien es mi mamá? Because it's very much a hybrid situation, and, and almost everybody who's Spanish in New Mexico has been there for generations is, is indo hispano as well. Sorry, I keep adding things, so this is taking longer. <laughs> anyway, I retain my, my uh, admiration for that ultimate and eye-opening feminist truism, the personal is political, and for its significant other, the political is personal. These remain living and dynamic propositions, a brilliant way to translate lived experience, positive and negative, into political consciousness. They open ways to understand others' experiences. When we know our family histories and those of our neighbors and of our lands, who and where we are in a political historical sense, we're far better equipped to be compassionate and collaborative within a time and place we all share. This is a photo by uh, Judy Natal in Iceland. I just happen like it. <laughs> uh, Iraqi American artist Michael Rakowitz is replica of the winged god from the Nergal Gate of Nineveh, which was destroyed by ISIS, is made of 10,500 Iraqi date syrup cans. Ultimately, words and images offer ways to integrate our own imaginings of life into those of a polity. Imagine action, all one word, was the title of a conference organized by the Alliance for Cultural Democracy in the early 1980s. The relationship of imagination to reality and action is crucial, especially for artists and writers like most of us. 
who specialize in acting in the gap between the two or between art and life. If we lean too far on the imagination side, we risk falling off the edge into wishful thinking, like visualize world peace. And then we fall back onto the couch, lean too far on the reality side, and we risk getting so discouraged that we get stuck in the status quo. This is an older piece about immigration to the uh, Lewis Hawk and um, Elizabeth Sisko and David Avalos did in San Diego years ago. And again, it's so pertinent now that immigration is the uh, main issue. We art workers have always had to be satisfied with small victories, with raising consciousness rather than raising politics or policies, changing policies. Sometimes we fool ourselves about how successful our projects can be. My friend Arlene Goldbard, policy wonk for the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, which of course is not the love child of the U.S. government, often says she wishes she had a penny for every time she's heard an artist claim to be changing the world. Yet every one of us has some faith in the art as a way of t inspiring and or jolting or even just pinpricking people out of their self-imposed or received stupors of adding visual layers to the global debates. I always say that art, art can't change the world, or art workers can't change the world, but with the right allies, little miracles can happen. Well, not, maybe not miracles, but a lot of hard work, organizing, catalyzing generation, hanging in, exactly what open engagement does. This is uh, my, my little village's feminist contingent. <laughs> Gatherings like open engagement can encourage clear-eyed analyses of what works and what doesn't. We need to discuss the failures as often as the successes. These times call for some tough love and honesty with ourselves and our colleagues, because being effective seems more crucial today than any time I can remember. And I've been messing with this for some 60 years. This is a piece that Joyce Cutler Shaw did in front of the UN uh, in the 70s. There's ice formed from water she gathered all over the world, from rivers all over the world. And then it, it melted. <laughs> So, once again, what do we want to say? How do we want to say it? Where do we go from here? I hope you haven't been holding your breath for answers to all these questions, because I ain't got them. But these questions are directed as much at me as they are at you. Personally, the temptation to be cynical, nasty, bridge burning can be overwhelming. But that puts us in the same bag as the opposition. There's a line between skepticism and cynicism. Somebody said pessimism is a waste of time. And optimists are just as utopian, woo-woo, politically reactionary. It's true that we need to be down to earth, but we also need something to hope for, something to reach for. And I hardly ever give a talk, and this goes for a lot of my friends too, without citing Antonio Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I don't think it's ever been better said. Thanks. before I heard the talk, and it's that... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? How about now? Better. Okay. I'm worried that they're talking to me. Oh, yes, stay away from this yeah. thing. <laughs> um, oops, I just lost it. Oh, okay, so um, being involved with open engagement, I started this work when I was an undergraduate, and I'm a... That noise. Um, I was a really big conceptual art nerd and I kind of came to social practice through getting really excited about dematerialization and learning about um, Art Workers Coalition and Printed Matter and then coming into doing um, 
artist-run work and artist-run initiatives. I was wondering what you, if you could um, give us some insight on what you took away from that and what lessons that you learned that can maybe help us do, do it better as artist-run initiatives. Well, that's kind of what I was trying to do with all of this stuff. So, uh, it, the times are so different now. It's, it's hard to draw specific examples from 40 years ago or 50 years ago. It really is very different, as you don't quite realize yet. But um, I, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, say, say the, the question again. Really. I almost used, by the way, a slide of yours that said, "It's a sign that says, I bet you think this is all about you." <laughs> Should have put that up at the end. Anyway, um, I just um, if there are ways that you can see us. Uh, kind of trying to reinvent the wheel that you're like, knock it off. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, <laughs> no, I think this is an amazing thing. I mean, we, we, I remember our little conferences were about 10th or whatever this size. So we, we did something called the February 16th movement or what was it? So February 22nd movement or something. Anyway, I can't remember what the, the date was, just the day we happened to have it, but we, we started. It was the beginning of a movement. And, and if, if uh, maybe that was successful, and maybe this is one of its children, who knows? It's hard to, I, I, as I say, I, I live in such a different context now that, uh, I mean, I had never met an elected official the entire 35 years I was in the city. And I was just out there mostly yelling at them. And as soon as I got to, <laughs> as soon as I got to Santa Fe, I met uh, my county commissioner who lives in my village, and, and the, you know, and Tom Udall and various people because it's so much smaller. Like Santa Fe itself, which is my shopping town, is only eighty thousand people or eighty four thousand now, I think. So it's a very small town. So it's a, you have to readjust. I, that's why I feel like place is so incredibly important. Because no, no matter where you're coming from, you've got to, you've got to know where you are at the moment. And, and it makes, I mean, I, they used to call me La Lucy, the New Yorker. <laughs> and I've tried to calm that down a little bit <laughs> since then. And then and being nosy in, other, in a tiny town like that, I, I just finished a book on the history of the village itself. And, and being um, nosy about other people's lives when you understand so little about other people's lives. I've been helped by editing this monthly newsletter for 21 years, so people are sort of used to my being nosy. But at one point, somebody asked me, I'd been interviewing her 94-year-old uncle, and she said, his family wants to know how much money you're making on this. And so the, the idea that you, obviously, you've published a lot of books, you must be rich. Ha. <laughs> but uh, so I said, oh, I'm glad you asked, because so far, I've been working on it for 20 years off and on, and I haven't made a penny yet. But last year, for my broader book on, on the Galisteo Basin, I made $87. <laughs> so that she said, good answer. <laughs> and that was the end. That was that. For <laughs> anyway, but I, I don't, I mean, I, I, I've just, I've, since I moved there, I've just become so enamored with the idea or so obsessed with the idea that knowing where you are and, and even the minute you walk out the door, you know, noticing where you are, which I don't think I ever did much in, in the city. I lived all over the place in Lower Manhattan. I, I did a piece called Seven Stops in Lower Manhattan at one point. But um, I didn't know my neighbors much, and I knew my art community and my activist community, but I didn't really know where I was at that point. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm short. <laughs> My last question, um, I think, is going to dovetail off of that answer really well, which is that I think a lot about, in 2016, Angela Davis said to us that this work isn't going to be done in our lifetimes. Um, and uh, I think that the blip of hum the human race will yeah, I can come sure to an end. <laughs> yeah. We'll come to an end soon. And I wanted to ask you about um, kind of the emotional impacts of being in this work for so long and knowing that these efforts aren't paying off. You started off the talk by mentioning that and also asking about your personal joy and kind of some, the emotional impact of, of knowing that things aren't really getting better, at least not at, 
they don't seem to be. Uh, they seem to be getting worse. Yeah. Well, I can't say I get a whole hell of a lot of joy at the moment out of, out of much of anything, but uh, well, hiking and landscape and being in the land, not landscape, but being in the land. But uh, the joy is really in the action, is doing something, do something, but be actually doing something. Because <laughs> that is important. I mean, we all know that. Everybody in this room knows how important it is to be doing something, I, I hope. Although I was kind of surprised. I, I obviously didn't ask the right questions about what you all were working on. And, and since, since, it wasn't, since I didn't really harp on sustainability, I, I know that several of you, or at least a bunch of you, are working on urban, rural farming, inner city farm stuff and so forth. And I'm sorry I didn't do more on that, but I had done something recently on that. <laughs> I feel like doing it again, but, but anyway. But the, but the, you know, the, the, the good feeling, even if you're failing, is that you're doing something. And I really find that that's, that's where it's at for me anyway.